Uh, hello, and welcome to uh, This Year in Ad Tech 2017. Uh, I'm your host, Radko Vidakovic. I also have my colleague, Terry, here with me today. Terry, how's it going? Good, Radko. How you doing? I'm doing good. So today we're going to be uh, presenting a recap of ad tech trends from 2017, along with our uh, analysis of you know, what we saw go down, how, we're gonna, how we see the year ahead unfolding. Um, we have a lot to get through today, as you know. Um, but before we begin, I thought maybe we should say a few, few words about ourselves before we begin. All right, so uh, just a quick word. Uh, ad Process is an ad tech uh, consultancy. We're based in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we work with a variety of companies in the ad tech ecosystem, publishers, brands, tech providers, legal firms, institutional investors, and so on. Um, our, our background is uh, pretty unique, uh, given the fact that uh, we worked on basically all sides of the industry. Uh, we've been on the publishing side, advertising, media buying side, tech side, agency side, uh, and now on the consulting side, uh, which I think really gives us a holistic experience um, within all parts of the industry. Yeah, and uh, I think you know what makes us unique and which, which is also what I really like about working with you is that we each bring a pretty unique perspective to solving problems in this industry. Um, your product and marketing background means you look at a situation one way and my legal and business background allows me to see it from a totally different uh, vantage point. So um, combined with the fact that we've both been behind the curtain at publishers, agencies, and tech companies, I think it allows us to see things in a way that you know maybe some other consultants can't. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, so, really, with that out of the way, I thought maybe we could just get into some quick, uh, some quick housekeeping. So, uh, so today is going to be pretty straightforward. There's, it's going to be pretty no nonsense. Uh, we're just going to basically get straight into the trends. We're going to finish with predictions, and that's about it. But mm -hmm. uh, as far as housekeeping goes, um, just since a lot of people have asked, we are going to be recording this, or we are recording this at the moment. Um, where it's going to actually be posted is. I guess it's still to be determined. Uh, it'll probably be YouTube, but we'll let everyone know uh, once we have that posted. Um, something else is we have a lot of material to get through. So uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along, but uh, I'm pretty sure we're not gonna have enough time to, to get through it. Um, but don't let, the, don't let that dissuade you from asking. If there's enough questions uh, and it warrants it, maybe we'll do another follow-up webinar where we just answer answer the questions or mm -hmm. Who knows, maybe we do an article, something like that. Mm -hmm. So as far as the trends that we're gonna be covering today, uh, none of these should really be a surprise to anybody who's a regular newsletter subscriber. Um, almost every week there's inevitably a story that falls into one of these themes. Uh, so whether it's ad fraud, transparency, uh, privacy and legal issues, regulations, so on, uh, what we call browser wars, walled garden wars, um, and then, of course, um, Amazon. So I think we should just jump into it, shouldn't yeah. we? Yeah, yeah, let's start. Okay, excellent. So first trend, uh, which I guess is unfortunately something of an evergreen trend, uh, is, is ad fraud. And so ad fraud uh, is basically, you know, it has many faces. There's, there's various ways in which it takes shape, um, but you know, every every year there's always um, there's always new developments on the ad fraud front, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's I think it's systemic. I think it's part of the uh, part of the way in which the, the industry is um, architected, right, around incentives and whatnot. Yeah, I think the uh, same factors um, that make programmatic compelling is the same ones that you know really expose it to fraudsters. You're talking about huge dollar amounts. Um, automated buying, which means once your algorithm is is spinning, you know there's no human vetting it to see if if there's some you know some sort of you know bad stuff underneath it, and then minimal human interaction. So there's less exposure for fraudsters because they're not walking into an agency and physically pitching them on a on a botnet. They're they're doing it via phone or email, if at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also just the the intrinsic uh, business model. Of, of, of the industry, the one that, that really pervades all the companies, which is, you know, percentage of media spend. I think it just encourages uh, volume over, over quality, right? Right. Some, some ad tech companies might not be incentivized to find some of this fraud necessarily, 
uh, unless their customers are demanding it. And same same with some agencies. They might actually like some of the fraud. Yeah, that's a very controversial opinion, Terry. <laughs> it's going to be full of controversy, <laughs> this webinar. I can promise yeah. you that. So, I mean, ad fraud, you know, on a serious note, ad fraud is is obviously uh, a big issue, not just an issue to the obvious um, principle, which is, um, you know, marketers. It's basically throwing money away. Um, but I think one of the second order effects of, of ad fraud is that, that it basically, um, every dollar that goes into the pocket of, of a fraudster is a dollar that's being taken out of the pocket of a legitimate publisher, a publisher that, that needs that dollar. Right. 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 So it's basically, uh, it's, it's, it's important for everyone to really address fraud, uh, not just from a campaign optimization mm -hmm. perspective. Let's talk about some so, of the, uh, big stories fraud related. Yeah. Yeah. I'll talk about the stories. So, you know, one story again, it's unfortunate that it just continues, but you know, video fraud, which is something that we saw all the way back at our days at site scout, um, video arbitrage, uh, continued. There were stories around there. And uh, it's really just uh, for for people who are familiar with it, it's it's inventory that's intentionally misrepresented as pre roll, and and usually it's uh, three hundred by two fifty ad slots that are being purchased and then um, being resold as as pre roll video inventory. Right. And uh, the Digiday article that came out this year said that up to seventy percent of video inventory is arbitraged. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty pretty staggering figure yeah that's crazy yeah it means it means basically the majority i mean if, if, if you believe that or if that's true it means the majority of programmatic video is is essentially a cesspool you know right. of, of of arbitrage and so again unfortunate but you know we're just we're just reporting the trends right right <laughs> so uh, in addition to that you know i think there's a number of big big stories um that were that were broken um Obviously, there's the there's the big botnets and whatnot. Uh, there's also uh, some really great deep dives from uh, from BuzzFeed this year. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, one of them was around uh, basically an expose around you know some of the world's biggest brands, P and G, Hershey, Disney, Ford, getting getting duped by by an ad fraud scheme that is really kind of just a reincarnation of of schemes that have been been going on since like 2013, and then reported again in 2015. So it's, it's basically the same, virtually the same methods, but just different actors. Yeah. You know, what was really interesting was the, uh, the amount of mainstream media coverage that um, ad fraud seemed to get this year between Buzzfeed and Bloomberg, Bloomberg and the wall street journal. Um, it really was, was uh, covered a lot more in the mainstream um, than, than I expected. And I mean, I think that was, definitely um, part of the reason that ad fraud was such a big trend um, because, you know, if it's an, if it's an, in an industry trade, you know, it can, it can be kind of brushed aside, but if it ends up on Bloomberg, you know, you know, the CEO is going to read that and ask uh, the marketing team what they're doing to prevent against ad fraud. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, you know, some of the, it, you know, another reason which I, you know, I threw out earlier this year in, in, in one of the newsletters is that I think there's also might be a bit of a bit of a conflict, you know, after all with the, with industry trades, you have, uh, you're essentially covering companies that also sponsor your, your events and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it can get a little bit, it can get a little bit dicey. You don't want to, you don't want to put your sponsors in a position where they, where they lose face. Right. Right. Um, so what else? Domain spoofing was a big topic. Yeah. Yeah, so domain spoofing, um, which you know is basically just again just misrepresented inventory. Um, it's it's people selling exchanges selling inventory that is labeled as one domain, whether it's let's say financialtimes.com, ft.com as a relevant example, um, which really isn't ft.com. It's either mm -hmm. you know injected injected inventory or or it's showing up completely you know, in, in another place, but it's really just, it's hurting the the brand and enriching fraudsters and whatnot. And so again, this isn't really a new issue. It's not really an, it's, it's one face of fraud, 
but right. it's not it's it's not a new one, right? I think we've I think this has been around since pretty much again since since like since we since we started on the tech side, 2011, yeah, people, 2012. People were spoofing Facebook inventory back then, even though Facebook didn't sell their inventory through exchanges. Exactly, exactly. So so I think that that's really come to the forefront uh, this year. Um, I think there was there was also another bot bot you know hif hif bot or hifbot I don't know how it's pronounced, mm -hmm. but uh, it was it was it was also revealed in the Wall Street Journal, um, discovered by I think Adform, but again it was just <clears throat> essentially a domain spoofing offer operation, um, at a, at, a, at a tremendous scale, um, so yeah definitely in the headlines, um, and so then I think that also what's the solution? What's the solution <laughs> to spoofing? Uh, so the solution to spoofing, or or the pro the proposed solution to spoofing, is a is a initiative that came out of the IAB called um, ads.txt or ads.txt. There's a variety of pronunciations, but it basically what it is is it's it's a very elegant solution. It's it's essentially a publisher putting a a file on their on their website that just lists you know the the IDs of the various programmatic platforms that are authorized to sell. Uh, sell their inventory mm -hmm. so kind of similar to the robots robots.txt but a little, little different but in in the same way it's just it's it's very elegant anyone can any publisher can basically do that declaration and then anyone can uh, can basically read that file to see you know who's who's authorized to sell that inventory and not right but to be clear that's intended to to prevent spoofing i think there's some misunderstanding uh, among some people in the industry this year that you know it's not intended to solve every ad fraud problem. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the case. You know, I think I think that some criticism has been has been lobbed at at ads dot ads dot txt, um, basically saying that it doesn't solve this and it doesn't solve that when it was never really engineered to to solve those issues. It was it was specifically around um, you know unauthorized reselling and domain spoofing and so on. So um, in that respect, I think it's um, it's actually quite uh, quite clever, right? Do you think this is uh, this trend gets cleared up this year, or do you think it shows up on our twenty eighteen trend list? I think it's I think it's 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 going to continue into twenty eighteen. Uh, ads .t so the ads txt initiative um, has actually been adopted, I think, extremely quickly uh, relative to to other technologies. Um, so it's been adopted extremely quick. I think there's there was some reluctance in Q4 because I think obviously publishers didn't want to do anything that would disrupt their Q4 mm -hmm. revenue, um, which is completely understandable. But I think right now in Q1 uh, 2018 is when most publishers are going are gonna to really implement um, ads.txt, and then really we're not we're not going to see the the effects of that until you know the remainder of the year. So I think it's going to be an ongoing story of you know consolidation. Right. All right. All right. So we should probably move on to the next. Yeah. Uh, let's go into our second trend. The next trend. Yeah. So let's talk about transparency. Transparency is a very uh, loaded word, right? Um, I think it's 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 a, again one of those evergreen uh, trends, especially in ad tech. I think just the the form of transparency has changed over time. So. Uh, Maybe five years ago, transparency was more around you know where are my ads showing up, right? So if you're a marketer, you know really what sites is my are, are my ads showing up on, and that was uh, you know a fairly a fairly substantial battle, right? And you know it got uh, I think for the most part it was it was it was resolved, um, but then now you know transparency and then uh, wasn't uh, it wasn't 2017 but in 2016 there was you know transparency around agency rebates and and you know what was happening with b between the client agency relationship and 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 all of that so uh that was that was really the the the, the focus in 2016 in 2017 i think what we saw was um really transparency on around auction mechanics and fees right. um and also just companies companies taking taking more control brand specifically taking right. more control adidas being a big one yeah adidas is is kind of the the new school uh, example of that uh, a more old school example would be 
uh, Netflix. I think Netflix was one of right. those uh, companies that that sort of pioneered um, creating an in-house trading desk or right. solution, right? For 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 taking their their media buying in-house and then really turning that into at, you know basically turning the transparency that they had from that from that setup into organizational insights and and really you know eliminating waste and really just doing everything that, that was in their in their best interest. Right. And there was a survey this year that that said that 84% of our advertisers want to bring programmatic in-house or at least take greater control over their programmatic buying. So I think that's a trend that's going to um, definitely continue going into 2018. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, there was that. Um, there was also a more recent one last month uh, from, from the ANA, uh, so the Association of National Advertisers um, uh, in the U.S., basically also also released a report talking about the the rise of of you know bringing programmatic in-house or bringing ad tech um, in-house and it makes sense right um it just it, it it provides that level of of transparency to some degree it's not a it's not a panacea but it provides that level of transparency mm -hmm. um for for brands um as opposed to and and really i think that also that also forced um ad tech players so ad tech vendors uh, to be be more cognizant about about offering self service solutions as well. Right, right. And uh, we we may be a little bit biased coming from uh, one of the uh, original self serve DSPs, um, but you know that that definitely is um, you know the future as we move into full transparency. And we'll talk a little bit about why we think that to be the case. But um, I definitely think self serve is going to be huge into twenty eighteen and beyond. Yeah, I also think it's not it's not a coincidence that two of the largest uh, advertising companies in the world, so Facebook and Google, have exceptionally strong self serve yeah, interfaces. Right, so, right, right, right. So let's talk about auction right. mechanics. What What do you mean um, by auction mechanics? So auction mechanics it really revolves around um, what everyone's or what the industry has basically been using for the last. Eight years, but basically since its inception, the real-time bidding, programmatic advertising has really been based on this second price auction. And second price auction is uh, basically taking the second the second highest price, uh, running with the second price highest second highest price as opposed to the the first price. Um, right. And use adding a adding a penny to it and and going with that. Right. And traditionally, that hasn't been very. Um... I guess transparent. It's a lot of the players in the industry, advertisers and publishers, don't really understand the way that the auction mechanics work or the implications on either their performance or the amount of money that they're paying or receiving in an auction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and, and it really just, um, you know, it's it, it it incentivized marketers to sort of bid high with the comfort that they're not going to actually pay what they're what they're bidding. They're going to pay. Um, less than what than what yeah. they're bidding so right. kind of encourage high bidding but then you know what we've seen uh in 2017 is really a, a spotlight being being uh being put on uh, on auction mechanics there, mm -hmm. there was reports this year uh around june and july of basically exchanges that were that were running first price auctions which is taking the, the highest price the first price and and uh and basically using that uh, in the auction or, or, or something right. close to it. Right. So right. maybe, maybe manipulating price floors so that it, you know, nets out to 98 to 98% of the right. or 99% right. of the, of the first price. So it's like a de facto first price auction, mm -hmm. um, which is understandable. Actually, it's a, it's, it's an understandable thing to do just given the, the nature of header bidding, um, which might be outside the scope of this, this webinar, we still have a lot to get through, but you know, essentially, if if uh, if if exchanges are not passing passing through the highest bid, they're kind of disadvantaging their advertisers uh, yeah. against all the all the other exchanges, which are all competing in this header auction. So right, it's not a true auction, um, or it's not a true. Yeah, it's it's not the it's not the ultimate auction, right? Yeah. The ultimate auction is happening on the publisher side yeah. um, through, through the increased use of header bidding. Um, so it's understandable why they would do it, but I think the the big issue. Is that it's not being disclosed, right? Yeah. So because uh, it obviously about, has a. How about fee transparency? Yeah. 
So fee transparency, fee transparency has been, um, I think again, also put into the spotlight um, just because there's a lot of ways. Um, I, I think that, you know, fees are, fees are transparent when companies are negotiating with their vendors, right? Or, or they should be tra transparent. What's the, te what's the technology fee? If there's any service fee, what's that? And everything is basically spelled out. But what's been happening uh, in 2017 and what we're seeing is that there's a lot of hidden fees yeah. um, and, it's, and it's happening pretty much uh, pretty much across the board from the supply side to the demand side. And, uh, you know, there's there's many ways. There's, there's actually a surprising number of ways uh, to to sort of <laughs> hide <laughs> fees. Right. <clears throat> you and, can charge you and, can charge the buyer and the seller. Um, you can break out a tech fee and then not disclose your media fee. Um, you mm -hmm. know, you can, you can, you can charge for proprietary data without disclosing that you're making a margin on that. Um, and then there's the always dreaded kickback bags of cash. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and actually that's, that's one of the reasons, I mean, there's, so the notion of buy side fees is, is kind of what, what got Rubicon into hot water with, um, Guardian, uh, if you recall, so yeah. there was, uh, I guess, uh, uh, there was a fee that that Rubicon was charging buyers that, I guess, uh, Guardian was not aware of, um, or that, or that, I guess that robbed them the wrong way, um, and you know that that really I think started the started the conversation in the industry around hidden fees mm -hmm. because buy side fees is just one way of call you know calling it, uh, but it's really just the any kind of any kind of undisclosed revenue stream that might impact another party, right? Because right. really we're talking about a finite amount of dollars. Uh, they flow in general, general terms from marketers to publishers and you know, how that gets chopped up in the, in the, in the middle is mm -hmm. really where, you know, all of this, um, that that's really the root issue here is right. how's that being chopped up? Who's being charged? What? Um, and that's really kind of the elephant in the room. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, and, and the great thing is that it's actually caused, it, it's, it's actually turned into a very positive thing, I think, because you have companies like uh, Adobe, which have rolled out, uh, basically trans transparency, uh, demands in their platform. So they show buyer fees from all the exchanges that they work with and yeah. basically let the, let the buyers decide, you know, who they want to, who they want to buy through. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because it's, you know, the logical conclusion of um, increased transparency, where you're able to see what you're being charged across the entire value chain, combined with the fact that a lot of ad tech um, uh, offerings are, are largely undifferentiated. Um, I mean, the, the logical end result is a price war. And it seems like we're starting to see that with Rubicon um, coming out and saying that they, they, they're working to be the lowest total cost per transaction provider. Um, App Nexus getting super aggressive on fees. And uh, of mm -hmm. course, Amazon, um, always a threat in a price war. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I think especially in the exchange space or the SSP space, uh, there is a there's a price war on fleeing, um, and it also seems like it's it's just a matter of time before that hits the demand side as well. Right. If I if I were an ad tech exec, I'd, I'd definitely be thinking about figuring out ways to decrease my infrastructure costs or my, or my personnel costs and get those under control because they're gonna have to work a lot harder to make the same amount uh, of money next year. No, that's exactly right. So let's move into the third trend, which, which is uh, pretty much your domain, um, privacy and legal. Yeah, so um, don't you love it when the lawyers show up to the party? Isn't that when <laughs> fun, the real fun starts? Yeah, they're um, my favorite. <laughs> so, um, what, one of the uh, biggest stories I think in 2017, which kind of flew under the radar, um, and I think it's because it wasn't necessarily U.S. centric, and it's not really the sexiest topic, but um, the, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, which in a nutshell is an EU regulation, um, which really just mandates the way that um, personal personal information of anybody in the EU. Um, can be accessed, uh, um, stored, and used, um, and and it, and it's a it, it really imposes some um, some really really um, 
deep obligations on companies that are, are interacting with these users to, to get consent and get informed consent and, and you know, use the information in a way that they say they're, they're going to. And considering the fact that the entire ad tech industry is built on this concept of using personal and non-personal data, um, if that goes away, there's going to be a drastic industry shakeup. And, and the GDPR is, is a piece of um, legislation in the EU that, that has the potential of, of, of dramatically impacting companies in the space. Um, so that's a huge story, um, but not just in itself, because I'm not sure that, you know, we'll necessarily see something, uh, similar being put in place in the U S but I think that the yeah. GDPR is really a, a, a reflection of consumer demand. Right. And, mm -hmm. and people are, people are, are, are getting wise to the amount of information that is being collected about them. And some of the big hacks that we see like Equifax and T-Mobile and Yahoo, it increases the likelihood that the industry will be forced to move in this direction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those are great points. And uh, and for, for people who don't know, like when is when is GDPR really going into effect? It's uh, it's coming into effect this year. So it's been in uh, um, it's it's been in progress, so to speak, for the last couple of years, um, where it went out and and they uh, uh, got feedback on it. Um, it's been finalized and, you know, in the next couple of months, it's going to be applicable in the EU. But what makes it really interesting is that it doesn't only apply to companies in the EU. It actually applies to anybody dealing with, um, they call them data subjects, but anybody that's in the EU. So if you're an American mm -hmm. ad tech company um, and you have any sort of, um, you know, monitoring activity uh, related to someone in the EU, then then you 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 can be captured by this. And, and the GDPR is no joke. I mean, they, they have fines of up to 4% of your annual revenue. So we could be talking like tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in fines. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about the impact on the, on the ad tech, on the ad tech ecosystem. So, yeah. you know, when I guess, you know, it, it's going to, it's going to impose, like you said, a lot of obligations on companies, right? So, you know, there's, there's also a possibility that, you know, companies that are evaluating ad tech vendors, um, are going to be either more choosy or they're going to select fewer, uh, just given the increased requirements of, of due diligence and compliance checks and audits. It's not, it's not going to be, it's not going to be so easy to just, um, you know, say we're going to test this new company or whatever, right? It's going to have to go through layers of, of, of compliance checks and it's just going to be, you know, a, a lot more red tape to, to, you know, the, to, to evaluate companies and work with companies, which means that it could it could basically make it harder for for new ad tech vendors to to compete. Yeah, on, on the one hand, it, it could definitely uh, create a barrier to entry. Um, on the other hand, it could create a, a moat for some of these companies that are able to um, figure out a way to perform the same services that that advertisers are asking for, but do it in a, a GDPR uh, world. So. Um, I think that, you know, some, some, some companies stand to get hurt more than others. And I'm, I'm thinking primarily of the retargeters like Criteo and AdRoll. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're definitely going to be forced to react to this. Um, and if they don't, you know, their, their value proposition to the market is going to be in, in significant uh, jeopardy. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, someone, someone that can figure this out under this new regime is definitely going to, going to have something valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's going to be a, uh... You know, it was already a big story in 2017. I think it's going to be uh, an even bigger story uh, yeah. uh, in, in 2018. So also so, along that note, um, uh, some legal action in 2017. We saw Uber sue yeah. their, their mobile ad agency, Fetch, mm -hmm. and then subsequently sue their ad network Funware for mm -hmm. stealing attribution for installs, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely not a, not a new issue, like not a new uh, allegation. But it's something that I still think uh, it, it was good. It was good that, that that it was you know done by a high profile company like Uber. Um, it was you know in the Wall Street Journal uh, because as we know the best uh, best disinfectant is sunlight. Um, so just just bringing this bringing this to to the attention of the industry um, of, of, of such practices. I think even though even though the issue or the alleged issue is not new. I think the the way in which they went about it, basically taking the nuclear option, is uh, is something that we haven't seen before. Yeah, I don't think that's necessarily a, a bad thing in and of itself. Uh, you know, we don't want 
too much litigation, but you know, if there's situations where this is going to help clean up the industry and, and get people to act in the in the way that they've um, uh, committed to acting, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. So that was yeah. one. We also saw Data Zoo sue their exchange rhythm one for shady mm -hmm. auction mechanics. So you know, the crossover of the trends, auction mechanics, and, and lawsuits here. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Um, and and it was also interesting to see that it kind of all happened around the same time, like within a, almost like a two month period, there was all of this uh, litigation happening. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, the third component of privacy and legal is privacy consciousness. And, and we touched upon this earlier, people getting more wise to um, the amount of data that's being collected uh, from them by, by a lot of, uh, you know, third parties in the industry. Um, and, you know, there was this, the wired story, which came out this year, which talked about how you can track someone's location with a thousand dollars worth of mobile ads, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, for, for, for most people that aren't involved in ad tech, um, is pretty stunning and, and scary. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then of course there was all the, you know, Cambridge Analytica news that, that was, you know, surrounding the, uh, the U S presidential election. There was right. that, that really brought it, you know, mainstream. Right. Um, cool. So let's, uh, let's move on sake of time and, yeah. uh, touch on the next trend, which is browser wars. Browser so, wars. Yeah. It sounds fun. Um, <laughs> I think there was a video game called Browser Wars. Right. Um, so basically, so Browser Wars, uh, for people who aren't familiar, um, basically Google's been Google's been using their Chrome, uh, their leverage with a Chrome browser to to make to make kind of sweeping changes to the industry. And so is Apple. Um, but let's start with let's start with Chrome. So uh, uh, Chrome announced, I think, back in June that they are going to start uh, automatically blocking. Um, not just all ads, but just annoying ads and, uh, annoying ads, I guess, as defined by the coalition for better ads. Right. So, yeah, so they're, they're basically, and I think it's actually being rolled out next month. So mid February, uh, they're going to start, um, they're going to start rolling that out so that, uh, you know, people are going to, obnoxious ads are going to be blocked. And then those that are remaining from from what I read from uh, director of product at Google, is that the what the ads that are remaining are either going to be forced to be viewed or whitelisted, um, or they're going to have to users are going to have to pay for the ads. So really, um, or for the content, yeah, you have to, they, have to, they pay for the content. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Paying, paying for the content, but wow. um, yeah, it seems like they're trying to really not just affect change, but it's it seems a bit heavy handed in the sense that, you know, they're they're I guess they're they're trying to eliminate the excuse that, you know, people block ads because they're annoying. And right. that, okay, once we have eliminated the annoying ads, you know, what's left over, you know, you basically have an obligation to uh, view it, put right. up with it, or pay, right? Right. And and needless to say, the uh, advertiser groups like the IAB, the ANA, and the four A's were not too happy about Google's approach. No. No, it's understandable too, right? They've they've uh, they've always kind of been proponents of self-regulation, um, which you know I, I don't know how effective that's actually been, mm -hmm. but you know uh, at the same time, I guess they're you know they're 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 spokesmen for the industry for the ad tech industry, so they're 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 obviously trying to um, do it in the best interest of ad tech companies and publishers and so on. So um, I wouldn't expect anything anything right. less, right? But uh, but yeah, beyond that, I think there's also been a response from publishers, uh, understanding that that these changes are coming from um, from Google. Obviously, when Google makes you know sweeping policy changes such as this, it really gets the attention of publishers. Um, I remember you know not that long ago, a couple of months ago, when they really um, forced uh, forced the adoption of Ads.txt. Mm -hmm. You know, adoption went through. Adoption went through the roof, right? I think they were they were a big factor in um, in making that happen. You know, just wielding their their influence for good. Yeah. And I think that you know, similarly, you know, publishers have just been reevaluating their their approach to ads. You know, maybe choosing less obnoxious ad units. Um, and I think there was even stories earlier this year from publishers like Little Things that were saying that uh, when they removed some of their ad units on the page, the revenue actually went up. Really? So it sounds like people don't like annoying ads. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Surprise. Like it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that was that was kind of a follow on to to sort of Chrome's uh, Chrome's announcements, Chrome's changes, um, which kind of brings us to the next uh, big change, um, which has already happened, uh, which is Apple's, uh, you know, the recent, ver relatively recent version of Safari rolled out with uh, a feature called intelligent tracking prevention, which blocks, which essentially blocks, you know, retargeting scripts and uh, autoplay video. Right. So, you know, the, the autoplay video, I don't think anyone would disagree with that or, or oppose that. Um, the retargeting part um, has definitely had, you know, a ripple effect. Right. <clears throat> uh, which we kind of touched upon earlier. Uh, Criteo, when it came out that iOS 11.2 was going to block their ITP circumvention method, um, Criteo came out and reported that their 2018 revenue could be negatively impacted by up to 22%. And their share price uh, very quickly dropped 26% right after that. So, yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah, it seems like they've, they have some, you know, circumvention techniques that are, that are in place to sort of address it. Um, but I don't know, I don't know if that's a good business strategy, first of all. Right. Um, second of all, uh, I think the, the key word in uh, the intelligent tracking prevention is intelligent. So it was actually designed uh, by, by Apple to, to actually change. And, and that's, you know, it, it's it's a good thing because you know it'll it, it can it can essentially detect you know when some circumvention takes place and it can it's fluid right so yeah. it'll 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 be a cat and mouse game but if I had to you know place my bets I don't know who would you bet on yeah I I don't think Criteo is going to win that fight I think they're you know they're going to have to adapt but you know constantly trying to stay one head of Apple I think is a is not the uh, the right choice. Yeah, it's tough. And and also I think <clears throat> just to be clear, it's not it's not just, you know, Criteo, right? It's uh it affects other yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, com co companies that are that are highly um highly invested in retargeting. So obvious examples include AdRoll, but obviously there's there's so many other um ad tech companies that right, leverage all, all data all data driven decisions are to some extent um, you know, based on the ability to identify users in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and that's really just kind of one front in a, in a two front war where, where if you have, you know, browsers attacking your business model on one side, and then you have essentially government regulation that's creeping up on the other side. Yeah. It turns into a very, uh, very tough situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I think that's probably a good segue. Let's get into uh, next trend, which is walled garden wars. So, uh, so what's a, what's a walled garden, Terry? Um, a walled garden refers to one of the uh, big players in the industry that are able to segment off their proprietary uh, data and inventory from the rest of the market. So we're talking about Facebook. Uh, uh, Google, you know, um, they're, they're the, uh, the walled garden, so to speak, very much like this mm -hmm. picture. They're able to yeah. keep everything neat and tidy within their garden. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the, and I guess the opposite of a walled garden would be just a mess uh, of, un, un, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just weeds. Right? Just, yeah. Right. So, so yeah, I think we're, so we're referring primarily to Facebook and Google and and other smaller walled gardens like LinkedIn and Twitter, mm -hmm. um, and so on. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, what we've seen this year, you know, reports coming out from uh, or forecasts coming out from uh, Dentsu, IPG, a number of others have just been, you know, showing uh, positive growth for for digital, overtaking many, you know, traditional traditional mediums. Um, and a lot of that growth being specifically from search, social, mobile, which are obviously dominated by a couple of companies, right? Right. So the good news is the uh, digital ad revenue is growing. The bad news is is that it's all going to Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, you know that's 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 had an impact on the 
I mean, it's had an obvious impact on the on the ad tech ecosystem. Uh, you have venture capital, which is you know essentially left you know left the space, um, but also it's it's just tough of of who's remaining for for everyone else that's remaining. You have basically have a slice of the pie, which is uh, either remains the same or is slightly shrinking depending on whose figures you uh, you go by. But you know it it just creates a very uh, a very competitive environment for for who who's um, for who's left. Um, yeah. Yeah. Totally. So uh, what are what are some of the uh, uh, challengers doing to try to try to compete against the walled gardens? So I think <clears throat> I think what we're is um, really the 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 main challengers are are the telco companies. So the the providers providers of uh, cell phone providers, cable cable providers, and so on. Um, so so telcos like Verizon, for example, is 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 one. Uh, they yeah. they have probably the most uh, most comprehensive roll up of of assets between Yahoo and AOL and all the other ad tech companies like Millennial and uh, and so on that that have been rolled up into uh, what is now called Oath. Um, and yeah, so basically they they announced Oath around June, and now they're uh, you know I guess they're going through the process of integration, mm -hmm. um, which seems challenging for you know given the number of companies that they have. Um, right. At the same time, you know I think that they that they are they are sitting on or they have the ingredients of of basically everything you need to be a differentiated player, right? They have uh, unique data in the form of their subscriber IDs. And then they also have all of their owned and operated properties through Yahoo and AOL. Yeah. So it just comes down to execution, right? But um, that's that's one challenger. Another challenger, which is a lot more nascent, uh, I'd say, is, is AT&T. So earlier this year, uh, AT&T uh, poached Brian Lesser from Group M uh, to build out their their advertising uh, division, their advertising mm -hmm. platform, um, which is great. And then shortly after, he poached uh, Kirk McDonald, um, who's you know former uh, president at uh, Pubmatic. Right. Um, so he he's joined he's joined AT and T now as the as the CMO. So it seems like they're just getting all the right people on board first, and and then the next their next step is. Uh, I don't know. We'll talk about it in the predictions. Brian Lesser is a board member on AppNexus, is he not? He is, yeah. yeah. Right. That's true. All right. Yeah. Well, foreshadowing Noted. some predictions there. <laughs> right. Uh, and then of course, you know, um, some other some other we, we could talk about Amazon. Amazon's obviously another um, common challenger that people talk about but um obviously we have our own section just for amazon let's so maybe we should let's talk. save let's save that yeah let's save that let's save that for uh for for its own section um i think something else that we've that we're also seeing which is again not a new thing but i think we're just seeing the frequency of it go up is this this notion of data cooperatives or data consortiums mm -hmm. so you know I, I, I hate to say weaker players, but it's really just like a bunch of weaker players that are that are joining forces to to create leverage, right? So um, I think one of the earliest examples of this was uh, Laplace Media, based out of France. Um, we were we were exposed to them um, back back in the Site Scout days, so circa 2012, 2013. Yeah. Um, Laplace basically took that notion uh, and ran with it in France, uh, and I think now we're just seeing it uh, being reincarnated through. You know, new cooperatives in, in different countries. Um, we're also seeing, I think, uh, firms like Critio has their own data cooperative that they that they announced earlier this right. year. Um, there's there's a number of there's a number of them just in the in the ad tech space alone. So there's you know there's the Open ID consortium, which is you know led by AppNexus and LiveRamp and a number of companies. Um, and then there's DigiTrust, which is led by Former former VP from Rubicon, um, but needless to say, there's there's no shortage of uh, consortiums. Um, we need a there. consortium of consortiums. Yeah, 
would you would you say I think that would that would solve the problem <laughs> yeah i think that's uh i mean i don't know if i was in, if i was in google google and facebook's place i wouldn't be yeah. really concerned i wouldn't be that worried about um a lot of these co-ops but well, in any case yeah. yeah i mean they're they're like really what other option is there um yeah you have to scale, scale up or or slim down you can't be in the middle you can't be in the middle mm -hmm. if you're going to be compete in 2018 yeah you got you have to have some kind of uh some degree of scale if, if you want to compete with uh, uh facebook google and others mm -hmm. so that said i think that's a good good segue to talk about talk about amazon yeah so amazon uh was also you know in the news this year i think they started off there was a there was a survey that came out from advertiser perceptions or there's a report uh, that came out from advertiser perceptions which was in ad exchanger and they talked about how um how amazon's dsp was actually uh one of the top if not the top um um dsp as as in terms of advertiser preference mm -hmm. and i think that shocked a lot of people because right. amazon's actually been very they've been very quiet right they've been they've been very quiet and from a, from a for a company that puts out a lot of press releases they've actually been extremely quiet when it comes yeah. to um when it comes to their their plans for for ad tech yeah it's uh it's interesting i, I remember in uh probably 2013 first hearing about amazon's their their then new um ad tech offering um which i think was a simply a bidder at the time that they were using but it was scary in the sense that you know it's amazon they're an 800 pound gorilla uh with just an immense appetite to take over every industry but you know, there was a sense that, you know, ad tech is, is so complex um, and so difficult to put together all the moving parts that it would take them a long time to catch up and build a competitive ad tech business. But, um, you know, and, and this was despite the fact that they have a massive amount of intent data and consumer data and, and publishing canvas, but um, it's been like four years and they have, you know, totally just mm -hmm. smashed into the Loomscape. It's been, it's been yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah. I don't know if it's the if it's like all the media covers they got this year, but they really they really feels like they um, came out of nowhere this year. I mean, everyone's yeah. everyone's kind of been aware of their direct bidder and you know some of the things they've had going on, but in terms of becoming a serious competitor in the ad tech market, I think that's really uh, that really came out in twenty seventeen. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they really have all the all the ingredients like we talked about. Yeah, they have a bunch of unique data, or they have a tremendous amount of unique data, uh, specifically around. Um, purchase habits and whatnot which is extremely valuable they also have an they have unique inventory so they have the talent they have resources they have technology they have a track record of execution um they pretty much have all they need to really fulfill their potential um mm -hmm. as a as a player um you know they have a they have a nascent dsp which is you know uh which was kind of announced this year it was, it was uh um like i said just it got a lot more press this year um not exactly the most um, full-featured DSP, but I think they're really they're really um, leaning on their uh, on their unique data as a differentiator. Yeah, um, and, and you know I think that's 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 the pro uh, in 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 their favor. I think the con is that you know I think I think we all know how competitive Amazon is as a company. Their their competitive character, their competitive nature, and mm -hmm. uh, and obviously their they have their own products. They're they have their own you know private label products. They're essentially a retailer. So there's, uh, you know, you think about all the businesses in which Amazon competes, which is you know a circle that only continues to expand. Yeah. And you know they they've 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 uh, shared some policies or, or some policies were, were disclosed this year that basically uh, show that they disallow competing brands from their from their platform um, that they see uh as as competitive which is obviously problematic yeah if i if i was uh an advertiser and and sold a product that amazon either competed against uh with their white label product or could compete against i would really think twice about um you know uh helping them in any form or fashion um you know dig yeah. dig my own grave so to speak yeah there's really no guarantee that they're that they're not going to run off really with your Mm -hmm. with your with your data or or that you're not you know um indirectly just giving them all the all the campaign data that they need to um 
essentially, you know, promote their own products down the line. Right. Right. So shall we move on? Yeah. Let's uh, just in terms of timing, let's, uh, let's move on to our secret trend that we didn't disclose. Right. Right. So, uh, so consolidation is, is again, it's nothing, uh, it's nothing that anyone hasn't already said. It's a, it's a trend that, um, I think when you, uh, when you really look at it, all of the previous trends, uh, support, support cons consolidation. So all of the previous trends lead towards consolidation. Um, mm -hmm. and consolidation is really just, uh, you know, it's just one way of, one way of expressing evolution or cleanup or maturation, like whatever the word you choose to, to describe it. But, um, I think really at the end of the day, it's, it's just describing that there's going to be a fewer companies. So I think everyone's, everyone, everyone's familiar with the Lumascape and how there's so many companies. It's, it's such a fragment, ad tech is such a fragmented, um, industry fragmented space, really consolidation just means, uh, the reduction of, of fragmentation. So there's going to be fewer companies, more consolidation, um, more simplification. Yeah. We talked right. about it, uh, earlier, but you know, you're either going to need to, uh, scale up to compete against the walled gardens or scale down to be able to be competitive and own a particular niche. Um, and, and if you're neither of those two things, it's going to be a very difficult go in 2018 and beyond. Right. Right. And I think there's, you know, a lot of just real examples of, of, of consolidation happening in front of our eyes, uh, in 2018 or sorry, in 2017. So we saw, we saw some really big acquisitions uh, early on in the year, uh, Oracle buying moat. Um, there was, uh, Altus buying Teeds, uh, then of course, Singtel buying turn. Uh, and then the big one was, uh, well, Maybe not big in, in terms of deal size, but big in terms of um, headlines and 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 you know talk is uh, seismic buying buying rocket fuel. Right. Right. Yeah. That was a big yeah. One. Not to mention you know not, not to mention the dozens of smaller you know smaller mergers, smaller acquisitions, uh, which kind of littered uh, litter the year. Yeah. So, uh, do you think this will? continue actually why don't we go to the predictions we can talk about whether we think this will, will continue into 2018 yeah so we'll i mean we've already talked about the increased rivalry we talked about price wars you know uh, all the things that are necessary really now to compete in a in a more competitive ecosystem and you know maybe we'll just skip the uh, the negativity of all the layoffs and mm -hmm. just skip right to uh skip right to predictions yeah so we'll also skip the skip this overview just given given the time so predictions uh i think there's two uh i don't know I'll, I'll, I'll sh let me start by just sharing my overall my overall prediction my my overarching prediction uh for ad tech i guess uh in general and it's kind of um uh, it's not it's not a very sexy prediction uh, but it's just that I think all of these trends are going to continue. So I think, I think it's common to see a lot of, you know, articles out there where every year there's some new trend or some, you know, some, some novelty that is going to be, you know, the big trend in 20, 2018, 2019 or whatever. Honestly, I think that all the trends that we cover today are going to remain the trends in 20, in 2019, uh, actually like for ad tech, for being a technology industry, it actually moves relatively slow. So I think that what we see is, you know, we see action. Uh, we're going to continue to see action around all of these themes. They're just mm -hmm. going to play out in slow mo slow motion, right? We're just going to see them play out over the over uh, over the next twelve months. All right. So um, I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask you to name names. Who do you think is going to get acquired in 2018? So. Um, so I have some, these are, these are uncontroversial predictions. Uh, other people have made them as well. I think they're, they're pretty, they're pretty obvious when you kind of just look at, uh, look at who all the players are, who's left and, you know, who's, who's positioning themselves. Um, I think Rubicon is, uh, seems like an obvious candidate just given their, um, you know, their historical and current market position, um, and also their current valuation. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that makes them attractive. Uh, I think App Nexus is also an attractive target. Yeah. Um, I either for a telco, major telco or a media company, just given their again the, those those kind of ingredients that are that are very valuable, right? Strong technology, talent, track record of execution. Yeah. Um, plus they have they have tech on both the buy side and sell side, so <clears throat> they're basically a turnkey you know ad tech solution for whoever wants them. Yeah. Um, on the DSP front, I mean, <clears throat> the the options are basically dwindling. So you have Media Math, Data Zoo, which are you know some of the last remaining companies left to acquire. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure about Critio. I think Critio might be uh, m- just given the direction of their stock price and the potential impact of GDPR and and potentially long term you know follow on uh, policy changes with other browsers. Perhaps um, they they could perhaps be a loser uh, in yeah. 20, 2018. Yeah, they 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 might be. They're definitely the ones that that stand to lose the most if uh, if uh, things play out the way we think it is. So they're the biggest loser. Who's going to be the biggest winner in twenty eighteen? <laughs> um, actually, I think uh, Terry Kawaja and his his colleagues at uh, at Luma Partners are 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 going to be in a are going right. to have a you know are going to have a banner year. Uh, right, if they were right. if they were a public company, I would probably buy stock in them, just given right. the uh, market conditions. And you know, the, I think there's going to be much more M and A activity. And right. <clears throat> obviously, it doesn't, doesn't hurt to be the best known yeah. you know, investment. All right. Um, what, what about and, you? Any 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 thoughts for 2018? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I, you know, I think I think we're going to continue to see um, aggression from the. <clears throat> Um, walled gardens, especially uh, around the uh, the browsers, and uh, you know, continuing to put pressure on some of the um, mid-sized and smaller ad tech companies. Um, I think that's going to play out in you know additional uh, consolidation, and you know, um, really a lot of a lot of ad tech companies are going to have to rethink the way that they operate and, and the way they do business um, in terms of their, their service offering, their cost structure, their infrastructure costs. Um, I think that will come to a head in 2018. I think it'll finally be the uh, the year that everything kind of shakes out, um, mm-hmm. um, which we've kind of been talking about happening for five years and it hasn't. So who knows? Mm-hmm. This year will be the year. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you agree that, you know, these trends are just going to continue. The, the trends that we covered today are going to continue yeah. in 2018. Just the, the magnitude is, is going to change. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Well, you know, for for anyone here who's who's listening, uh, most of you are most likely uh, already uh, subscribers to our to our weekly newsletter, uh, This Week in Ad Tech. Um, if you aren't, uh, you'll most likely, I mean, if you like this webinar, uh, you'll most likely like the newsletter as well. Um, thanks for listening. And thanks, Terry. Great conversation. Thanks, Racco. Talk to you soon. See ya.